from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So now I'm very honored to be introducing Jean Luen Yang, who has created some of the most inventive and unusual graphic novels of the last 10 years. Mr. Yang grew up in the Bay Area and loved animation and comic books from an early age. He began drawing them when he was in fifth grade and had his first comic published when he was in his early 20s. He has published many titles while also teaching high school, high school students, um, but his 2006 book, American Born Chinese, was the first graphic novel to be nominated for the National Book Award and the first to win the Prince Award. Last year's Boxers and Saints, an ambitious two-volume work set during the time of the Boxer Rebellion in China, has also won many awards. Mr. Yang's latest book is a collaboration with illustrator Sunny Liu called The Shadow Hero, about what may be the first Asian American superhero. As Washington Post reviewer Michael Kavna described their achievement, they have retrieved a long lost creation from the spidey webs of history, and the resulting story is a cartoon yarn exceptionally well spun. I'm sure you are eager to hear from the author illustrator himself, since he is also a great speaker. Please help me welcome Jean Luen Yang. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited to get this chance to talk to you all. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit more about myself. I am a cartoonist, which means I write and draw comic books and graphic novels. I've been doing this for about 15 years now. And here are some of the comics and graphic novels that I've done during those 15 years. Recently, about, about two years ago, I got involved with these books right here. Any of you seen the show called, OK. It sounds like a lot of you have seen the show called Avatar The Last Airbender. Now, if you have not, you really need to go watch the show. It's amazing. Okay, you can find it on Amazon Prime right now. Uh, Avatar The Last Airbender ran on Nickelodeon from 2005 to 2008. It was so awesome that they did this sequel show called The Legend of Korra that's airing right now. What Nickelodeon decided to do was fill in that gap between the first show and the second with a series of graphic novels. They asked me to write these for them, and I jumped at the chance because I'm such a huge fan of that original show. The best thing about working on these comics is um, I get to email Mike DiMartino and Brian Konitzko, the creators of the show, and they email me back. <laughs> it's awesome. Now, uh, last September, First Second Books, one of my publishers put out Boxers and Saints, which is a two-volume graphic novel all about the Boxer Rebellion a war that was fought on Chinese soil in the year 1900. The reason why there are two volumes is in my research for the Boxer Rebellion, I could not decide, whew, sorry, but I could not decide who the good guys were. So the protagonists in one volume are the antagonists in the other. I wanted to look at this war from two different perspectives. For today, what I'd like to do is talk to you about Asian American culture and comic books. And at the very end, I'd like to share with you a little bit from my most recent book called The Shadow Hero. Any of you read comic books regularly or used to read comic books regularly? Okay, a decent number of you. Now, if you are the kind of comic book reader that goes to your local comic book store, you will have noticed that recently in America, we have been experiencing something of an Asian invasion in American comic books. There are just tons and tons of Asian Americans working in comic books today, in the American comic book industry. I don't have firm numbers to back this up, but I would argue that there are probably more Asian Americans working in American comics than in any other American entertainment industry. For instance, there is Linda Berry. She's half Filipino, so I'm claiming her. And there's Greg Pak and Jay Lee and Debbie Huey and Jason Shiga. There are just a lot of us. A lot. A lot. Now this last guy that popped up on the screen, his name is Jim Lee. He made his name as an artist in the, in the 1990s. He worked on X-Men and became this fan favorite artist. You would go to a Comic Con and there'd be lines out the door waiting for his signature. Eventually he founded his own 
company called Wildstorm. He, he created his own characters. He sold this company to DC Comics, the publishers of Superman and Batman. Uh, and now he's the co-publisher. He's one of the head cheeses at DC Comics. I would argue that Jim Lee is probably the most powerful man in American comics right now. The most powerful man in American comics is an Asian American. How did this happen? Parents everywhere, Asian parents everywhere are actually asking, how did this happen? Because working in American comics is not one of the approved professions, right? It is not doctor, lawyer, or engineer. And this question becomes even more perplexing when you look at the history of how Asians and Asian Americans have been depicted in American comics. Here is an example of what I'm talking about. This is from the late 1800s. During that time, America was seeing this huge influx of uh, Chinese immigrant workers. And people in this country were a little bit freaked out about how all these immigrants were going to affect American culture. So pressure began to build on the government to do something about it. And newspapers all over the country started publishing political cartoons like this that featured very stereotypical images of uh, Chinese and Chinese Americans. They usually featured very exaggerated facial features. They would wear like a very simplified version of traditional Chinese dress. And eventually, the people behind cartoons like this won. Uh, they, they, uh, America passed the Chinese Exclusion Act in the late 1800s, effectively ending legal immigration from China into the United States for several decades. This sort of imagery was not limited to political cartoons, it was also found in early American comics. I'm sure you've all heard of Batman. Now, did you know that Batman began his life as a character in a series called Detective Comics? Did you all know that? That's why we call him the world's greatest detective. But, okay, so a lot of people know that. A lot of people know Batman began in Detective Comics. What a lot of people don't realize is that Detective Comics did not begin with Batman. Batman didn't show up until this issue right here. This is issue number 27. So if you go to your grandparents' house and you dig around in that attic and you find this, uh, you'll be able to buy a new car, a new house, and probably a small island. This, this book is worth a lot. But, uh, so Batman doesn't show up until issue number 27. For issue number one, the publishers decided to use a character that they felt like was much more marketable and appealing than any of the heroic characters that they had in their stable. This is what Detective Comics number one looks like. The main character is this guy named Ching Lung, who we would now refer to as a yellow peril villain. He was designed to play on the fears that America had of the Chinese. He's basically a Fu Manchu knockoff. He's this super genius from, from China, bent on taking over the West. DC Comics, uh, the publishers uh, of this book right here, are kind of easy to pick on because they're the oldest comic book publisher, but I'm gonna do it anyway. During, the, during, the, during World War II, um, DC published these adventures of this team of superhero pilots, and they would fight for the allies, right? Uh, they were called the Blackhawks. There was one member from every allied nation. So there was an American guy, there was a French guy, uh, and there was also a Chinese guy. The Blackhawks all had these awesome blue uniforms, these really snazzy looking blue uniforms. All of them, except for the Chinese guy. The Chinese guy, whose name was General Chop Chop, looked like this. His costume was yellow and red and green. It's like this weird version of traditional Chinese dress. Uh, and General Chop Chop even had uh, a catchphrase that he would say whenever he was mad. He would say, uh, General Chop Chop been double clossed with an L. One of the weirdest characters in the DC universe is an arch villain of Wonder Woman. It's this guy right here. Egg Fu is also a yellow peril villain, a villain designed to play on the fears that America had of the Chinese. But he's not a human being. What he is is a man-sized yellow egg. <laughs> and he has a Fu Manchu mustache. And his superpower is that he can take this mustache and use it like a lasso to wrap around Wonder Woman. Believe it or not, Egg Fu is still around in modern comics. This is what he looks like nowadays. They took away his mustache, but he is still a giant-sized yellow egg. So these are all examples from DC Comics. Uh, Marvel Comics also had its share of yellow peril villains. 
the Mandarin, which is a, a, an arch enemy of Iron Man, began as basically Fu Manchu with magic rings. I think they've evolved his character since then. But in early comics, these sorts of characters were very common. Now, fortunately, they were not all these crazy, weird stereotypes. I, um, I, I'm, I'm a comic book fan, so I like digging around in old comics, and I was able to find an example of an Asian American character, a heroic Asian American character that dates back to the late 1930s and early 1940s. And this guy right here, his name is Fu Chang. He's a golden age character. He was actually a backup in this series right here. Uh, Pep Comics, the main character, the main guy, the main feature was this guy named The Shield, who's kind of like Captain America. He's a patriotic hero. But Fu Cheng was in the back. I mean, he still existed. Now, he wasn't a superhero. He didn't have any superpowers. But what he did have was a magic chess set. And the pieces of his chess set would come to life and help him solve crimes. Fu Cheng is a quintessential Asian American. He was born in China, but he was educated at an American university. He spoke perfect English, which was very, very rare back then for a, car uh, a cartoon character. He lived in an American Chinatown. He dressed in Western clothing. Unfortunately, his arch nemesis looked like this. His name was the Dragon, and he was yet another Yellow Peril villain. When you read these early Fu Cheng comics, um, one of the one of the weirdest things about these comics is it shows you what a difference in skin color an American education makes. So, <laughs> Fu Cheng, American educated, the dragon, not. In order for Fu Cheng to activate this magic chess set of his, he would have to put on this traditional Chinese garb, this simplified version of traditional Chinese garb. And the weird thing about this is whenever he put this on, his skin color would change. So there he is in Western clothing, and there he is in Eastern clothing. Fu Cheng is one of the few examples of heroic um, Asian American characters coming from early American comic books. There's another one named the Green Turtle, who's actually the subject of my most recent graphic novel. So I'm going to save talking about him until the very end. Now, fortunately, things got better. In the 1970s, America went through this collective obsession with, with Kung Fu, mostly because of Bruce Lee, and comics reflected that. During this time, Marvel Comics put out this, um, this character, this, this book, called Shang-Chi, the Master of Kung Fu, who was basically a knockoff of Bruce Lee, but he was heroic and he was sympathetic. And there was also this book called Yang of the House of Yang that was out at that time. It wasn't very popular, it didn't last very long, but I wanted to include it in my slideshow because I like that name, Yang of the House of Yang. Things got even better in the 1980s. I grew up in the 1980s, and uh, I watched a lot of TV and read a lot of comic books. What I noticed was that G.I. Joe, in particular, had a number of Asian and Asian American characters, and they were not flat stereotypes. They were usually three-dimensional characters with interesting backstories. I always wondered why that was. As an adult, I figured out why. It's because of this guy right here. This is Larry Hama. Uh, within comics, he's kind of a legend. He's a, he's a comic book writer and artist that has been working for a long time. He's a, a Japanese-American, and he wrote most of those early G.I. Joe comic books and cartoons. He is the reason why there are so many Asian and Asian-American characters within G.I. Joe. Larry is also the guy who got Marvel Comics to stop coloring their, their Asian characters that crazy yellow. He told me one day, I got a chance to hang out with him in New York uh, a, a few years ago. I'm name-dropping right there. But, uh, but he told me that one day he went into the Marvel offices and he went to the coloring department and he said, why do we color our Asian and Asian American characters this bright yellow? That is not actually a, a human skin color. And they said, well, it's just something we've always done. And then Larry said, well, maybe we should stop. And they did. 90s, uh, in the 90s, things got even better. X-Men has always been a center for diversity in, in, in all of its forms, right? And there are plenty of... Um, Asian and Asian American X-Men. There's Sunfire, who's a Japanese national who can shoot fire out of his hands. There's Jubilee, who really feels like somebody who, would, who I would have hung out with in high school. But she is quintessentially Asian American, born in La Jolla, California. Um, she can shoot fireworks out of her hands. And then there's Psylocke. Now, Psylocke was born British. She was born white. But then she was kidnapped by these, Asi uh, these Asian ninjas and given an Asian body. So I'm claiming her as, as one of us. 
So things have gotten better, but it still doesn't answer this fundamental question of why. Why are there so many Asian Americans in American comic books? This is something that I like talking about with my cartoonist friends, usually after a convention, usually over a couple of beers. I'm going to share with you right now a few, three, of our beer-fueled theories as to why there are so many Asian Americans in American comics, okay? The first one comes from the structure of the medium. Comics are a combination of words and pictures. There are words and pictures working together to tell you a story. If you look at traditional Western culture, words and pictures were always seen as two separate disciplines. The people who were super good at words were not the same people who were super good at pictures. Two separate disciplines. Now, whenever they came together, whenever words and pictures came together, the results would be considered vulgar or childish or immature. If you look at traditional Eastern culture, it is not like that at all. If you look at traditional Japanese printmaking or Chinese brush painting, the image is always paired with words. In traditional Chinese brush painting, an image isn't considered complete unless it has a poem to go with it. <clears throat> and the entire work is not considered masterful unless both the image and the words are masterful. So maybe there are so many Asian Americans in American comics because something about our cultural heritage prepares us for this combination of words and pictures that is comics. The second theory comes from the origin of the comic book. The comic book as a format was invented in the 1930s uh, by two employees of a, of a printing press. And within a decade, it became this mass medium, selling millions and millions of copies every year. A lot of the early greats, most of the early greats, were these poor, young, Jewish American boys who grew up mostly in New York. There was uh, Jack Kirby, Joe Schuster, Jerry Siegel, uh, Stan Lee. These four guys together created a lot of the Marvel and DC universes. There was uh, Joe Simon who co-created uh, Captain America. Will Eisner is considered the godfather of American comics. He was one of the first cartoonists to bring cinematic storytelling techniques into comics. There was uh, Bob Kane, who was a co-creator of Batman, and uh, Harvey Kurtzman, who helped found Mad Magazine. All Jewish Americans, all outsiders. If you look at early American uh, comic book stories, you'll see these Jewish roots reflected. So for instance, let's take Superman, the quintessential uh, and, and the first superhero. Superman, as a baby, was put in this metal basket and launched into space to save him from doom, right? And then he grows up to be the savior of a people. This is a lot like Moses. Moses, as a baby, was put in this basket of reeds, launched into a river to save him from doom, grows up to be a savior of a people. Superman has this critical weakness that saps him of all of his strength. In his case, it's a glowing green rock. This is a lot like Samson, who also has a critical weakness that saps him of all of his strength. In his case, it's haircuts. So from the beginning, comics has been a medium for outsiders. Maybe Asian Americans are attracted to comics because of this outsiderliness. In fact, if you look at a lot of these early comic book stories, American comic book stories, you can see Asian America reflected in them. Let's go back to Superman. Superman is dark-haired, he's black-haired, he wears glasses, he's mild-mannered, he has two different names, he has an American name, Clark Kent, he has this foreign name with a hyphen in it, Cal L, he wears two different sets of clothes, he wears American clothes and these weird foreign clothes. His parents are non-English speaking scientists who sent their kid to America for a better life. I think you can make a very strong argument that Superman, in fact, is an Asian American. Now, the last theory is from American cultural trends. If you go to any bookstore these days, if you go to any library, you will see a lot of this, a lot of Japanese comic books, manga, all over the place, very, very popular. <clears throat> In fact, you'll find these people. These are, these are what we call the manga aisle hobos, right? <laughs> any library or any bookstore will have them. So over the last decade or two, Japanese comics have become this huge, powerful force within American comics in particular and American books in general. Well, I already talked to you about how uh, the comic book format was created in the 1930s. 
it very quickly got exported all over the world, and it took particular hold in these different cultures. One was France, and the other one was Japan. Now, it took hold in Japan, and then, it, and then Japan and America had these two parallel comic book cultures that kind of grew up next to each other, right? Uh, for decades and decades, there was very little cross-pollination between American and Japanese comics, so they each came up with their own way of publishing comics, and they also each came up with their own way of communicating uh, visually. Here's an example of something that, up until very recently, would have been foreign to your average American comic book reader. Those of you who read manga, you see that little plus sign in that character's forehead? What does that mean? You all know what that means? Go ahead. It means that this character is angry. Like, physically, it's supposed to represent a vein popping out of this character's head. This is something that was very common in Japanese comics, virtually unfound in American comics until very recently. In Japanese comics, this became so common that, that artists started using it like this, where it lost all represent, representational value, right? It's just pure symbol now. Well, because of this huge influx of Japanese comics into the American marketplace, American readers are now pretty savvy. American readers now expect storytelling methods that reflect both Eastern and Western traditions. A lot of Asian American cartoonists, like my friend Derek Kirk Kim here, uh, a Korean American, grew up reading both Japanese and American comics. So they were already there, right? A lot of Asian Americans started off doing comics that drew from both of these cultural sources. So they anticipated the, the current desire that the American comic book reading public has. Unfortunately, for Asian parents out there everywhere, uh, I don't think this trend is going to slow down at all. I think as we move on, we're going to see more and more young Asian American writers and artists come into, the, uh, come into American comics and establish a, a voice for themselves. So I'd like to end by sharing with you a little bit about my most recent project. Uh, a couple of years ago, on the internet, I learned about this hero called the Green Turtle. The Green Turtle was created in 1944 by uh, a Chinese-American cartoonist, one of the first Asian-Americans working in American comics, a guy named Chu Hing. And there's a rumor about the Green Turtle. The rumor is that Chu wanted him to be a Chinese-American superhero, but his publishers wouldn't let him do it. Now, Chu Hing is a cartoonist. The way we react to adversity is passive-aggressively. And that's what this guy did. Chu Hing drew all of his original Green Turtle comics so that we almost never see the character's face. Most of the, uh, of the panels look like this, where the character has his back to you, and all you see is his cape. Uh, when he is turned around, it'll look something like this. Something will be blocking his face. It'll either be his own arm, because he's punching, or another character will be standing right there, or, uh, or a piece of furniture will jut out and cover his face. And the rumor is that Chu Hing did this so that he and his reader could imagine his hero as he originally intended, as a Chinese American. I don't know if those rumors are true, but they were intriguing enough that I wanted to do a project about it. So I researched it, I found out that Green Turtle is now in public domain, and that Chu Hing never got around to telling us his origin story. So he never confirms for us whether or not his character is in fact a Chinese American. Green Turtle only lasted five issues in a series called Blazing Comics before he was canceled. So I teamed up with a friend of mine named Sonny Liu. I did the story and he did the art and together we created the Shadow Hero, which gives our version of an origin story for this obscure character from the 1940s. In our version, he's a young Chinese American man named Hank Chu, who's growing up in 1930s Chinatown. Uh, this project has taken us several years to do. I'm thrilled to finally have it out in the world because I have loved superheroes for a long time and this is my very first superhero graphic novel. So at this point, are there any questions that I can answer? I think we have about five minutes left. Any questions? Go ahead. Oh, will the story of Green Turtle be accepted as canon? My version of Green Turtle be accepted as canon? Um, you know, when you're talking about a character that only lasted five issues and then disappeared, the concept of canon is very loose. <laughs> so, so, you know, the Green Turtle, he's still in public domain, so anybody can do their own version based on that original. And, and I'd be interested in seeing, you know, what else comes of it. I have to tell you, there's a Kickstarter that came up 
uh, where this dude was making these, uh, these uh, action figures for obscure golden age heroes, and I emailed him, and he, he made one for the green turtle. So it's on sale now. You can buy it for 25 bucks, which I know is a lot, but it's because he's so obscure. Go ahead. Uh, did your parents actually meet because your dad had the thickest glasses? Oh, okay, you're referring to, to, um, to American Born Chinese. So in American Born Chinese, the, the main character's parents tell him, you should not, if you want to get married, you should not worry about anything but studying, because the thicker the, your glasses are, the, um, the more likely it is you'll be able to attract a mate. And um, I, my parents did say that to me, yeah. <laughs> but they were wrong. They were wrong. <laughs> Oh, oh yes, go ahead. Are you planning on doing uh, a graphic novel for The Legend of Korra? Okay, the question is, are you planning on doing the graphic novel for Legend of Korra? Now, I don't own the characters that belong to that universe, so I have very little control over that. You know, that's really a decision for Nickelodeon. Do if they ever ask like me to do something like that, though, I would, I would definitely say yes. That would be awesome. Go ahead. Uh, I found Boxers and Saints when I was doing research on the Boxer Rebellion, and every book I found was either really boring or very biased. And I started wishing that there were comic books like this for every single two sides of history. So I was wondering if you were ever going to look at another conflict in history again, um, what would it be? If I were to look at any other conflict, what would it yeah. be? And do the Ooh. same type of um, graphic novel. And do, you know what? I, I have to tell you, I'm not a historian, so I don't know my history very well. But. Um, but I mean, I, mean, I mean, that period of, of uh, history that the Boxer Rebellion fits in, the Chinese call their, their century of humiliation. And there are all these different interesting pieces to it. Uh, mm -hmm. It'd be great to do something about the Taiping Rebellion, mm -hmm. which is this rebellion led by a Chinese guy who believed that he was Jesus Christ's younger brother. And then it would also be awesome to do something about the Opium Wars. But thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you very much. Hi. I really liked reading American Born Chinese and the Boxer Saints series. Thank you. And I thought that they would make really great movies. So I was wondering how you feel about tra like what's lost when you translate something from comic book form into a film. Into a movie? OK, so you're talking about the translation of comics into movies. Um, I think it can be done really well. I think Persepolis is an example of something that is both an amazing comic book and also an amazing movie. I have had some interest, a little bit of interest, from, from Hollywood into my, uh, in my comics. I've always been really wary of it, because I've had friends go down that route, and it very rarely ends well for the cartoonist. You know? And especially with American Born Chinese, my fear is that if it ever gets translated into either something animated or something on film, that um, I will find on YouTube these little clips of my character, Cousin Chinky, completely decontextualized. And that would just, I would not be able to sleep after I saw that. So I, I've always been really wary. Thank but you. thank you. Thank you for your question. Go ahead. In the book Boxers, they reference a war between China and Japan. Would you ever do a similar book to Boxers and Saints? With, about that? about that, that would be a great idea. I think I would need to learn more about it. So that I, 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 would, I would have to feel like I had a handle on both sides before I, I did something like that. But that would be a great idea. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, I really appreciate you bringing in the history and talking about um, some of the racial issues in comics. So I'm wondering, as the illustrator of the, um, you know, the Avatar books, um, if you have comments on um, the casting controversy in the movie. <laughs> okay, your question is about the casting. You know what? That is how I got this job. That is how I got this job. So what happened was, you know, I was a huge fan of the Avatar uh, series. And the Avatar series is set in a fantasy world, but it's a fantasy world that's based on real world Asian uh, and Inuit cultures. And if you read the notes from the show, it's very apparent that all of the characters are supposed to look either Asian or Inuit. When, then when they made this live action movie, they decided to give all the heroic roles to white actors, right? And they would release these pictures from the set where you would have a white actor, you know, standing in front, and then all these brown people behind him who are supposed to be his blood relatives, right? Uh, and they would just look ridiculous. It, it looked ridiculous not just on like a political racial level, but just purely if you loved Avatar and you wanted to see a fateful uh, translation of that into a live action film, that was not it. So what I did was I um, wrote a webcomic about how mad this made me 
and I ask people to not watch the movie. So to this day, I have not watched that movie. And, and uh, although I've heard that the casting is the least of its issues. <laughs> but one of the people who saw this comic that I did on the internet was an editor at Dark Horse Comics who Nickelodeon contacted to do these graphic novels. So when it came time to do the graphic novels, she knew I was a, a fan of Avatar. She called me up and offered me the job. Basically, I got that job by complaining. <laughs> so I'm advocating that you all do the same thing. Well, it looks like, it looks like uh, we are out of time. Thank you so much for being here. It was really a pleasure to talk to you all. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.